If I was to ask how many of you, and don't raise your hand, but if I was to ask how many of you were baptized as a baby by sprinkling with water, I bet there would be several raised hands. I, mine would be raised. When someone decides to give their life to Christ and become a Christian, part of that outward sign of their decision is baptism. For me, it was a imp really important time in my life. And, and it was really confusing. And I had a lot of questions. When I was a, a baby, I, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And very few, if, uh, hardly, at that time, there were hardly any Baptist churches up there. But my mom and dad, they didn't, ju they didn't jump from church to church. We, st we found a church, stayed at it, and we were there until at least I was 23, uh, 23 years old. So it was really the only church we knew. So I was sprinkled as a baby. And the thought was, hey, I was in. You know, I got sprinkled, you know, I, I was baptized, I was in. That was the thought. Uh, as I, when I got to be a teenager, I had to go through confirmation and go on Saturday mornings and memorize a lot of verses. I got confirmed, and I thought that was it. Um, Dad was uh, the deacon at the church. Mom was Sunday school superintendent. We were real active. All my friends were there. But it was a Sunday thing. And uh, there, uh, though, there, was no, there was no baptism other than the sprinkling. That was fine. Finally, one day, Dad, one day Dad came home on a Wednesday, and he said, I resigned from the church. And Mom said, what, what are you talking about, you resigned from the church? He was a deacon. He says, well, he was at a deacon meeting, and they, they were arguing about how much increase to charge for the Wednesday night chicken dinner. Should I go, I'm not kidding. Should I go up a nickel or a dime? This was a lot of years ago. And he said, I can't believe that Jesus wanted to be like that. So he resigned. And he started going to a little neighborhood church. Mom was Sunday school superintendent, so she had to wait until uh, her term ended. Then she resigned, and she went to that church. I didn't, you know, I was old enough to make up my own mind. All my friends were at the old church. I didn't want to leave, so I, so I didn't. Besides, I was sprinkled. I knew I had uh, assurance. I was, of course I was going to go to heaven. Good kid, never murdered anybody, never did anything really bad, or at least didn't get caught. And, and uh, uh, so I, I wasn't so concerned about it. Uh, the pastor at the little church that mom and dad were now going wanted to meet with me. And, and uh, I just was too busy. He was a nice guy, I guess. But I was too busy, and I said no. I said, you know, we'll do it down, down the road. I'm kind of busy this week, maybe next month. Well, back in the, uh, back in the 60s, the, the uh, Vietnam War was going on. Everybody got drafted. If you, uh, uh, unless you had one leg, uh, everyone got drafted. So, and of, course, every, of course, if you could, you went to college, because that got you two S deferment for four years. So I went to college with some of my friends, and the week before I graduated, I got my draft notice. So Uncle Sam didn't forget. So I'm getting ready to go to the, the military, and I get a call, and it's the pastor from Mom and Dad's church. And he says, Don, I know you're going away to the service. We've tried to get together to talk. Uh, you've been busy, I understand, but can you give me 15 minutes? I said, sure, just to check them off my list. You know, I know I've been putting them off, so I said, okay. So the night before I went into the service, I went to his study and uh, figured, okay, there's a party for me in, a, in uh, uh, an hour. I can put my 15 minutes in, check him off, and then get to my party. Well, he explained the plan of salvation to me. I was there for two hours. I never made the party. And from what I understand, it was a great party. They didn't even miss me. Uh, uh, I accepted Christ. The next morning, I got on an airplane for Fort Dix to start basic training. First time I'd ever been on an airplane. But uh, I'm telling you all this because, remember, I was only sprinkled as a, as a little child. Two, two years, ten months later, I came back to Wisconsin uh, with my new bride, Sue, and uh, we, we started going to that same church, and I was baptized by immersion at that little church, and we were, we were members there. No, actually, that's not true. We were not members there. It was a, uh, I'm not even going to tell you the, the denomination, because uh, the people were very good, but they were really strict. Uh, I had to go before a panel. I was very active in the church. Were you in the choir in that church? I can't remember. In Milwaukee. Okay. Um, uh, well, but I was very active. I taught a youth, or I was working with youth at something called Brigade Boys. We did a lot of different stuff. It was a great church, great people. But I went before the board, and they said, first of all, do you dance? You can't dance, and you can't drink. Well, my dancing was really bad, so I didn't have a problem with that. 
But, hey, I'm from Wisconsin, and there's, there's, a, there's a, few, a few breweries in Wisconsin, and uh, pretty much everybody drank a little bit. You know, I, d- I certainly didn't believe in uh, overdoing it, getting intoxicated, but I says, wait a minute, isn't there some passages in the Bible where Jesus was drinking wine? I says, why would I think that's wrong? So I wouldn't say that, that uh, I felt that drinking was wrong, and I never, was, I never could be a member. So we attended that church for nine years, and very active, and very good people, but I could never be a member. After 10 years in Milwaukee, the company that I was with transferred me, and we went to St. Louis, and I got a nice promotion. And we're driving down, there's 270 goes around St. Louis, if you're familiar with that, and on the south side of that 270, there's a church, big steeple right on the frontage road, and we saw it. I asked Sudi at at Renee, how did we end up going to that church? Different denomination. We stopped there. It was a Christian church. So talked to the pastor a few minutes. He he immediately could find, realize that we were Christians. Great. We were involved in the church. I don't remember there was, was, I don't think there was any baptisms there at all at that particular church. Didn't make any difference. So uh, I was involved in a church. We were members of that church. Could do a whole bunch of things. We were there for three and a half years. Got transferred again. Went to Memphis. That's where the problems came in. Here I'd been, I'd been a, a member of the church in St. Louis. Uh, we were active. We were doing good. Went to Memphis. Tremendous community. A tremendous church ethic there. Uh, Sunday, our church was not just a Sunday thing. It was an everyday thing. I'd never seen, I'd never lived in the South. And it was really amazing how many things went on there. Uh, went to a church, a Baptist, Southern Baptist church in Germantown, which is a suburb of Memphis. Uh, Dr. Story was the pastor there. Excellent church. However, uh, we talked. He knew I was a, he knew I was a Christian, but uh, I'd not been baptized as a Baptist. I says, women, I was baptized. I was baptized way back in Milwaukee, you know, 12 years ago. I've been, I've been a member of a church in St. Louis. I've been very active uh, in the church community. There's no question I'm a, that I'm not a Christian. He says, but you've got to be baptized here if you're going to be active in the church in, um, in Germantown, Tennessee. So, it was a problem. The first church we went to in Milwaukee, sprinkling. The second church in St. or in, uh, yeah, the second church, they would allow me to be, I, I was immersed in Milwaukee, but because I couldn't dance, or, well, I didn't care about the dancing, but I didn't agree with some of the rules, I couldn't be a member. Uh, then the church in, uh, in, uh, in, in St. Louis, again, no bap- there weren't any baptisms there, I was a member. But, but in Tennessee, I had to be baptized again. So that's when I started having a lot of questions and I decided I better look at, I wanted to see what scripture really said about all this. Some of the questions that we're going to look at today that I ask, uh, what is baptism? Uh, when should you be baptized? Can you go to heaven just by being baptized? And why should you be baptized? And maybe the most important thing, what does scripture say? Uh, because hey, if it's in scripture, I know it's going to be right. So that's what we're going to take a look at. First of all, what is baptism? What is baptism? The word baptize comes from the original Greek word baptizo. Baptizo. Baptizo is a term used in the first century for immersing a garment first into bleach and then into dye, both for cleansing and changing the color of the cloth. So you immerse the garment first into bleach, then into dye, uh, both cleansing and, and changing the color of the cloth. When you process cloth to change its color, you were said to baptize the cloth. That's where that word comes from. Note the similarity in today's baptism with the symbolic acknowledgement of our cleansing and becoming a new person in Christ. But it started with, cleans- with baptizing cloth, bleaching it, and changing the color. There are three New Testament words related to baptism in the water. The one we just looked at, baptizo, means to immerse or dunk. There's ratizo, which means to sprinkle, and there's alu, which means to pour. So immerse or dunk, baptizo. Ratizo means to sprinkle, like I was when I was a baby. Alu means to pour. Baptizo is the term used in the Bible to describe examples of biblical baptism. Baptizo, immerse or dunk. Nowhere in the Bible does anything but immersion take place. Let me repeat that. Nowhere in the Bible does anything but immersion take place when they talk about baptism. In Scripture, baptism baptism is always by immersion. 
If biblical sprinkling, sprinkling had been practiced, a different Greek word, retizo, would have been used, and it's not. The process of baptism by immersion implies entering into water where another Christian lowers you under the water and brings you back up out of the water. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a pastor. Think of some of the, the best baptisms we've had at this church, and maybe it's the father, or maybe it's a deacon baptizing their son or, their son or daughter or a grandchild. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a daughter. If you're a Christian, you can, you can do a baptism on somebody, according to Scripture. I'm sure, I know according to this church. Okay. Some faiths uh, believe in sprinkling water on folks, like I was when I was a baby, instead of immersing them. Where did that tradition come from? Where did that process of sprinkling actually come from? Let's look at that. When should you be baptized? First, does a person's age make a difference in baptism? Should infants or young children be baptized? The practice of baptizing infants started around 400 A.D. when a man named Augustine started emphasizing the biblical concept of original sin. 400 A.D. Everyone inherits the sin of Adam by birth because of the sin in the Garden of Eden. And it's therefore separated from God from the beginning of their life. We all have, have that, that sin. Parents were concerned, 400, back in 400 A.D., parents were concerned uh, about, over the fate of their children. What if the child dies before getting right with God? So they decided to baptize them to take care of original sin. Since it's a risky to, to immerse an infant in water, the practice to sprinkle them with water was initiated instead. Thus, both baptizing infants and baptizing by sprinkling derived from human ideas, not from the Bible. No instances in the Bible of, uh, of sprinkling or infant baptism at all. There are no examples in the Bible of very young children accepting Christ. Now, I started thinking about that. I, c- I couldn't think or find any examples in the Bible of anyone accepting Christ. Now, Pastor Brandon's talked about this here a month or two back about his children. When the church started talking about prayer, how important the prayer was going to be this year in our church, he prayed for his children to be able to come forth and make that decision for Christ. Our son is a pastor in Wichita, and we've got, as you saw, three, uh, three young grandchildren. Jewel is seven years old. The boys will be five years old. This, uh, one of them's birthday is, was just the other day. So one is seven, one is five. The seven-year-old Jewel, the little girl, Wants to, be, wants to accept Christ. Nick, my son, who's a pastor, in which I said no. And she wanted to accept Christ because her friends are accepting Christ. And Nick and, and, his, and his wife, Liz, want to make sure that when that decision is made, they understand what it means to accept Christ before they say, yeah, let's do it. You can be baptized. You can accept Christ be baptized because her friends were being baptized and accepting Christ. Brandon said the same thing. Uh, up in sanctuary here a month or so ago. And of course, now we know that uh, two of his children have made that decision and are being bath- have been baptized. Uh, so there are no examples in the Bible of very young children accepting Christ. A child is safe in the arms of God until they understand what it means to be saved by accepting Jesus as their Savior. Let me say that again. A child is safe in the arms of God until they understand what it means to be saved by accepting Jesus as their Savior. God won't judge a child for something they don't know or understand. Thus, only adults and children who fully understand what it means to personally accept Christ are candidates for baptism. How does our church deal with children? Well, those are some of the best ceremonies ever. You, uh, our church, you, you've seen, I'm sure you've seen several of them. The mom and dad are up there with their newborn child, and the child is consecrated or dedicated, not baptized. Consecrated, and what does that really mean? That means we pray for the parents, we pray for the children, that they grow up in the nurture and admonition of Jesus Christ. But as a little baby, you know, that's, that they've got to come from time of reason. My seven-year-old God, uh, granddaughter isn't quite there yet. Uh, so it, it takes a while for them to get to the point where they'll understand. But that's how our church does it. Do we baptize children, little, little children, babies? No. Do we sprinkle? No. Okay. No water is involved with ch- small children. Okay, second, 
When in the process of accepting Christ, should you be baptized? When in the process of accepting Christ, should you be baptized? Should I get baptized immediately as a part of accepting Christ or later as a follower of Christ? If we look at different denominations, they handle baptism differently. Uh, some denominations don't believe in immersion, just in sprinkling. Uh, but in some denominations, it even varies based on the church. One church in a denomination might believe in one practice in one way. The same denomination, a different church, could practice another way. You, you don't see that consistency overall. Different churches have different philosophies. Some churches say baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace so it can be done later. An, baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace, so it can be done later. Or, you need to grow in Christ, become good enough, before you're ready to be baptized. You need to grow in Christ, become good enough, before you can be baptized. Some churches, that's their philosophy. Or, to join our church, you have to be baptized into, you have to be baptized into our church. Like the, that was a situation with the, the church in Germantown that we attended. Okay. The problem with all these ideas is they're in conflict with the Bible. All of them. All the ones I mentioned, they're in conflict with the Bible. We're going to look at a couple of biblical references. And if you've got your Bible, turn to, and I'm going to read you some of these. I didn't put them on a screen because there's one that's really long. I really like it. So you're stuck, you're stuck listening to it. But... But most of them are short. The first one is on Pentecost. You can see the, you can see the list up here. The first one is on Pentecost. That's Acts 2, chapter, 30, or ch chapter 2, verses 38 to 41. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 to 41. Peter, Peter, the apostle Peter is speaking. He says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, get this now, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Verse 40, this is Acts chapter 2, we're now in verse 40. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. This is the first day of the Christian church. 3,000 were accepted that day. As we read a couple of these verses, I want you to, to kind of look, and where does baptism fall in the, in the process? Uh, they accepted Christ, they were baptized. Where does it fall? Is it always one before the other? Uh, what are you, you going to find? We're going to keep your, keep your figure in the book of Acts and turn to chapter 8. Chapter 8 of the book of Acts, verse 26. This is, all these are stories that you know, but I bet you there's a couple of things you don't know. This is Philip and the eunuch. Philip and the eunuch. I'm not going to go there, but you know what a eunuch is. But I'm, I bet you, if you I, I, when I read the story, you're going to know where that eunuch came from. It came from Ethiopia. You know where Ethiopia is? I didn't. But you know where Ethiopia is? It's in Africa. It's in Africa. This Ethiopian, uh, in all likelihood for sure, was black. He was pr probably the first black Christian to bring that message to Africa. I was lucky enough a few years ago to go to Uganda. I mentioned the orphanage. And uh, was there for a couple of weeks, two and a half weeks. And uh, tremendous thirst for God's word there. And there's a lot of people that know it. But this, this eunuch, in this story we're going to read, what by, at least by all biblical indications, is the first time someone has gone and brought the message of Jesus Christ to Africa. Okay, we're in, we're in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Philip and the eunuch. Verses, uh, verses 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. By the, by the way, that road is still there. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. 
this man has gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in the chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. I'm skipping a couple of verses. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. Now, we know where that road is from Jerusalem to Gaza in verse 36. It's terms as a desert. And the only water there was oasis, an oasis water. You know what an oasis is? in the middle of nowhere, all of a sudden there's a palm tree or something, and there's a, there's a pool of water. The, actually, it's public drinking water. The only water there was oasis water. This means that the eunuch and Philip climbed down into the people's drinking water to be baptized. Wouldn't it have been easier to sprinkle? Man, you're in the middle of the desert. A little sprinkle, if, it, if that would have done the job, rantizo would have been used, but No. Baptizo is, is the word that's used. They were immersed right in the middle on that desert road, right in the middle of that oasis water with all those people with their jugs looking, saying, oh, I hope he took a shower. You know. Uh, okay. Filipino. Next one we're going to go to is Paul. Acts chapter 9, only a few pages away, uh, verse, uh, verse 27. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. This is Acts chapter 9, verses... I said 17, I'm sorry, I said 27. Acts chapter 9, verses 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul, he was known as Saul then before Paul, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, the road to Damascus, as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again, he got up and was baptized. Okay. The last one we're going to look at, and this is, what, this is one of my favorites. Cornelius, the Roman centurion. This is in Acts again. Turn to chapter 10. Cornelius was the first non-Jewish convert to Christianity. The first non-Jewish convert to Christianity. When, what's someone called who's, who's not Jewish, generally? A Gentile, right. Anyone who's not Jewish, it could be Greek, could be Roman, is called a Gentile. So, obviously, the Roman centurion, Cornelius, wasn't Jewish. But, there's such, there's such really good, good truths in this, in this verse. I'm at, I'm at Acts chapter 10, verse 1. We're going to read a little bit here. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, what was known as an Italian regiment. The regiments had a thousand men in them, each, each one had a different name. This was called the Italian Regiment. Uh, the regiment was broken into six, six divided by six, and each centurion had a sixth. So he had a minimum of a hundred and some odd men. Verse 2, He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Okay, was he a Christian? No. But he, was he a dev devout? Yes. Was he God-fearing? Yes. We're devout. We're God-fearing. We know a lot of folks that are, but they're not Christians. Neither was Cornelius. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, Cornelius had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius start, uh, stared at, his, at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He said. The angel answered, Your prayers, listen to this part, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. This is verse 4. Have you ever thought about your gifts, your tithes, your offerings, going up as a memorial to God? A little scary, isn't it? Verse 5. Now send uh, your, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Verse 5. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who's called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Then the angel who spoke to him, when it was gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa to find Simon. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, now, now, now it moves on to Peter. Remember, Cornelius sent two guys to find Peter. But what's so interesting, particularly for us, 
because not every there's Jewish people in this room, but but most of us are Gentile. Look what happens right before the soldier and the two attendants get to Peter's house. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof. Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down by earth to, uh, by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. A voice said, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter said. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. Jewish law was very clear on the things that Jewish people could eat. And what was in that, that sheet that was coming down, those were unclean, unclean animals. And, they, and a Jewish person could never eat them. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. When Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So the Spirit talked to Peter, said, accept these guys. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we've come from Cornelius the centurion. He's righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to come, to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you had to say. I thought it was interesting that Cornelius didn't go to Peter's house. Instead, he had, he had Peter brought to his house. But that's what the angel said. Then Peter invited the men into his house to be his guests, and the next day they started out with some of his brothers from Joppa, uh, verse 24. The following day he arrived at Caesarea, Cornelius was expecting them, and had called together his relatives and his close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell on his feet in reverence. Now this is a, this is a Roman centurion. And he falls on his feet in reverence when Peter comes to his house. Plus he's got all his relatives and close friends in the house. He didn't, how, did, how did he really know that Peter was going to show up? It could be a little embarrassing to have invite all these people and then nobody shows. But Peter did show up. Peter, verse 26, but Peter uh, made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am a man, only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you're well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. For when I was sent for, I came without raising any objections. May, may I ask why you sent me, sent for me? So from there on in verse 30, it goes on to explain the plan of salvation to everybody in his household. And we're going to skip on to, to, uh, to verse 42. He said, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it, he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testified about him, Jesus, so that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message, everyone in that room, the friends, the family, everyone that Cornelius had invited. The Holy Spirit came on them. The gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out. Uh, Peter was astonished. Whoops, whoops, whoops. I skipped the verse. Verse 45. The circumcised believers, that's the ones who came from Joppa, that were Jewish, who had come with Peter, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, verse 47, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the first experience, the biblical example that we have of non-Jewish people being, being baptized and being accepted Christ and having the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay. As you, as you saw those things, well, we're going to read Jesus' own words. Well, first of all, when you, when you saw those things, what order did they come in? If you were looking for a structure, and particularly if, when they accepted Christ and when they were baptized, which came first? I'm sorry? Accepted Christ. Every single example. And I got a five or six more, but you, you wouldn't want that. They accepted Christ first, 
Then they were baptized. They were not baptized first. Okay. Jesus' own words, Matthew 28, 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountains where Jesus had told them to go. When he, they saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. How in the world does that happen? Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Verse 19. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we see Jesus' own words about accepting, making a decision, accepting Christ first, having a personal relationship with him. Remember, Cornelius was a devout man of God. Cornelius prayed to God regularly, but he didn't have that. It was kind of like when I went to that church in Milwaukee. I believed in God. We went every Sunday. We gave, but it was a Sunday thing. I didn't have a personal relationship with Christ, nor did, my, nor did anybody in my family at that time. The Bible is clear. Acknowledging Jesus in a personal relationship always comes before baptism. Thus, whenever you gave your life to Christ is the right time to be baptized. If that was some time ago, consider now as a step of faith, uh, fulfill what God asks of you. Can you get to heaven by just being baptized? People are saying, and some, some denominations believe that, People are saved and get to heaven by believing that Jesus is the Christ and putting their faith in him. Baptism alone does not save. The robber on the cross. The robber on the cross, if you think about it, he was the very first Christian. Was, was he baptized? No. Did he, make an, did he accept Christ? Yes. And he was the very first Christian because when Jesus died, he died for his sins. Before that, Jesus, of course, was still alive. He hadn't, he hadn't been crucified or resurrected yet. I can just see when, the, when the, up in heaven, when that very first guy comes up and the angels are looking down, this is the first guy we get, you know, the robber. But there's hope for all of us. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Nothing we can do can make us good enough to, to uh, get to heaven. We just saw grace and mercy on that video clip uh, through Christ. It makes us whole. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourself, a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Okay, why should you be baptized? Oh, man, I'm late. I've made my watch is slow. The Bible gives several reasons why, to be, why we should be baptized. However... The, the, to put it simply, we get baptized because Jesus asked us to. That verse we saw in Matthew, Jesus asked us to be, be baptized. Uh, the robber, went to, robber wasn't baptized, he went to heaven. It's not a, it's not a requirement to, uh, to be saved, but it's something Jesus asked us to. What if you accepted Christ, be, became a Christian, and were baptized by immersion while in another faith, like I was? That's called, and this is the real word, alien immersion. Alien immersion. That's actually the technical, technical. That's actually the term. If you, were, if you accepted Christ, became a Christian, and were baptized by immersion while in another faith. At this church, at this church, you'd be considered baptized and accepted as a member and fellow believer. The church in, in uh, Tennessee, that's not the case. But here at this church, at First Baptist Raytown, if you were baptized, accepted Christ, and were baptized in another faith, and came here, uh, you, you'd be accepted as a member. Was Jesus baptized? Yes, by his cousin John the Baptist. But why? Billy Graham was asked that question, and here's how he answered. Why did Jesus seek out, seek out John, uh, John, of course, his cousin, and baptized him by the Jordan River, Matthew 3, 13 and 17? The reason is because Jesus, who was the sinless Son of God, took upon himself your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole human race, just as he, he didn't have to die, so he didn't have to be baptized until he became the bearer of all our sins. This he did by coming to earth for us. Again, Billy Graham's answer. From the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus demonstrated that he was the promised Messiah, and in the words of John the Baptist, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His baptism was a sign of this great truth, and it was confirmed immediately by a voice from heaven saying, this is my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. 
Matthew 3, 17. No, Jesus didn't need to repent, but we do, for we have sinned and our only hope is Christ and his sacrifice for us. Have you opened your heart and life to his forgiveness and his cleansing power? I certainly hope so. If not, examine it and get it right today. Okay, we're just about done. Duncan, dunk or sprinkle. These are, some of the, these are some of the truths. What is baptism? When should you be baptized? Can I go to heaven just by being baptized? And why should you be baptized? Now you know what scripture says. I hope that today's discussion has made the question of baptism a bit easier to understand. It's clear we're baptized to publicly acknowledge our identification and life commitment to Jesus Christ. Baptism provides the evidence that all Christians, without discrimination as to color, race, sex, age, or class, share the grace of Jesus Christ. To put it simply, we get baptized because Jesus asked us to. It's an outward sign of an inward decision that we made. Jesus' last words before he left Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Well, now you've heard the what, the when, and the why. The only, the only question left to ask is what will I do now? And that's between you and, that, and God. Let's close with a prayer. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.